I'm the uh, director of the Information Economy Project here at the George Mason University School of Law. And uh, today we're delighted to uh, sponsor the latest uh, installment of our Big Ideas About Information lecture series, where we bring uh, important, innovative thinkers in the information economy here to Arlington to uh, give us their thoughts in a wide-ranging, unconstrained discussion. And uh, we save time for Q&A afterwards, so please write down your questions as we go here. And I'm sure we're going to have some uh, interesting uh, dialogue with our speaker today, who is uh, one of those people who has indeed changed the world. Uh, indeed, uh, my uh, normal uh, caution to audiences is to uh, be careful at the outset uh, to, uh, out of respect for the speaker, to turn down your cell phone. Uh, but today it would be fitting justice if you didn't. <laughs> and uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, our lecturer today is an inventor, an innovator, an entrepreneur, and a thinker has been intimately involved in the uh, creation, deployment, and improvement of wireless uh, and particularly cellular technologies that have indeed rocked our universe. So, uh, Marty Cooper uh, is, is uh, actually a little more than that. I had the pleasure of meeting him a few years ago uh, at a, a trade association meeting. Uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, I, I felt it was my responsibility as an academic economist to straighten him, uh, straighten him out on the subject of spectrum policy. And uh, much to my surprise, Marty didn't do the rational thing and run away and hide like most CEOs. He, uh, he actually uh, engaged in some very enter uh, uh, entertaining and informative conversations, and uh, we've con uh, continued that dialogue over the years. And so I am personally delighted to see him here uh, in Arlington and to uh, have him present to us uh, his talk today, Personal Communications and Spectrum Policy for the 21st Century. Now, as the brochure says, uh, Marty is the uh, CEO of a company called Raycom, uh, a firm uh, based in California but doing business around the world uh, that uh, uh, specializes in what's uh, uh, called array antenna technology that improves the capacity of cellular networks and, uh, in fact, uh, also specializes in uh, uh, technology that is now being deployed in some markets, not the U.S., for high-speed wireless, uh, some call it 4G technology. That's a particularly uh, exciting application that's come out of the Arraycom venture. Uh, Marty is uh, probably more famous, however, for his uh, activities uh, previously with the Motorola Corporation, and uh, uh, where, where he, in fact, uh, was intimately involved uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in a fatherly way in the development of the cell phone, made the first uh, cell phone call, and uh, my colleague tells me that he uh, did a little Googling uh, on this uh, topic and found out where that first cell phone call went. And uh, uh, Marty Cooper, being uh, a competitive engineer, made that cell phone call to the folks at Bell Labs that had not <laughs> completed the first cell phone call. <laughs> at least that's what Google search says. So. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll leave it to uh, Wikipedia to straighten out the facts on that. <laughs> At any rate, uh, we will have a talk by Marty Cooper. We'll have slides. Uh, then we'll have Q&A afterwards. And then uh, about 5.30 or so, we're going to break, go to a, a little reception out in the atrium of the law school. And I hope everyone here can uh, join us for that as well. And I give you Marty Cooper. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Tom. That was, that was supposed to be an introduction, not a major address, you know, but, uh, but thanks. Anyway, uh, it's a really great honor to come and talk to you. We've got an intimate group here, so I'm going to try not to read a speech. Uh, I, I uh, am especially uh, uh, honored because, or especially interested in what's going on now, especially uh, all of you read about JetBlue, JetBlue strike at uh, and Tom asked me to get up here and give you my perspective about you know, how smart antennas are going to change your life, which I assumed would immediately put everybody to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but whenever I uh, think about perspective, 
and I hear about airline pilots, I think of the story about these uh, two uh, pilots that were coming in for a landing at an airport. Pilot, co-pilot, we really need to put our lives in their hands, don't we, when we fly in airplanes. Uh, these guys uh, might not have been the brightest guys in the world. But, uh, the pilot comes into uh, the airport where he's landing. Uh, he says, you know, this runway looks a bit short. Uh, give me quarter flaps. The co-pilot says, quarter flaps. And the pilot comes in and suddenly guns the engine, pulls the stick back, goes back up in the air. He says, you know, that runway was much shorter than I thought. Give me three quarter flaps. He circles the airport, comes back in again for the landing. And for the second time, just before he touches the ground, full power, pulls up. He says, that runway is really short. Full flaps, co-pilot says, full flaps. Circles the airport again, comes in for the landing. The wheels touch down, full reverse, and the, and the air airplane shudders to a stop. And the pilot says, boy, that runway was sure short. And the co-pilot says, yeah, but it sure was wide. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about uh, personal communications. Uh, as Tom says, uh, I am an engineer by training, so um, almost all of my address has to do with economics. <laughs> but uh, I, I really would try very hard to uh, use only uh, uh, half of the allocated time so we can have a question and answer session. And those of you that heard me speak before know uh, I really uh, hunger for a good fight. So. <laughs> Uh, please uh, save up your hard questions, and uh, hopefully we can get into an interesting argument. So we're talking about personal communications, and what's the essence of that? It is that people are mobile. They're inherently, naturally mobile. You, you see that every time you come in on the Beltway. You uh, see that when you walk in downtown uh, uh, Washington. Somehow it seems like everybody is going to some place where they're not at now, and they're not where they want to be. And yet, we in the telecommunications business, for the better part of 100 years, have told people that when you communicate, you have to do it chained to your desk with this copper wire. And then finally, you know, when we uh, got around to doing uh, uh, wireless communications, uh, we uh, uh, told you that you could uh, Oh, before that, we did have, uh, if you recall, car telephones. Uh, that was a brief period in our history. Not much better than wiring you to your desk. Now you're trapped in your car. Now, finally, cellular came along. We now have the freedom for voice communications. But if you want to communicate with your computer, and we do a lot of that now, once again, you are constrained either to a very expensive uh, and slow service, which somewhat characterizes what uh, sell your services today, or once again you get trapped uh, at a Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, which is not a lot different than a phone booth, if you think about it. What really, what people really need for what I call personal communications, uh, is ubiquitous, reliable, ever decreasing in cost, ever increasing in bandwidth communications. Ubiquity, low cost, and lots of bandwidth. There's no technological reason, there's no real economic reason, I will try to demonstrate to you today, uh, why we can't deliver that today. But we are far from having that. And at the top of the list of the excuses that we have for why we don't have very low cost, ubiquitous, wide bandwidth, uh, is the radio spectrum. There are a lot of people working on that problem. A lot of dedicated public servants, uh, industry experts. They have yet to figure out how to manage the radio spectrum in ways that can realize low cost personal broadband. Instead of encouraging new technology that drives cost of services down, we create the appearance of scarcity. Spectrum now looks like it's extraordinarily valuable and that tends to discourage innovative spectrum use. And instead of driving the use of the spectrum to be more uh, uh, effective, we encourage people to stockpile spectrum, save it up for some future use, to keep it out of the hands of 
uh, innovators. And instead of allowing market forces to drive the industry forward, we meddle with the market for spectrum uh, and we keep those market forces for operating. Not to say that people aren't trying real hard. The FCC, the Department of Commerce, NTIA, they're all driving the industry to be more creative, to introduce new technology, better technology. But for the most part, the proposals that you hear talk about using long-range future technologies and big changes in the regulatory process. What I want to suggest today that neither of those uh, is necessary that the technology exists today and that you don't to, to uh, uh, provide low cost uh, personal broadband and that you don't have to change the regulatory process. This, this process that I talk about, technology that exists today, uh, and that process is already uh, underway. We're already uh, implementing it. But it's not widely understood of what the magnitude of improvement is going to be. Tom was needling me about the fact that we keep talking about revolutions. And the reality is that a revolution in technology in general uh, takes, for the technical part, a generation, 20 years. You can't think of any technological innovation that's happened in less than that. And if you want to talk about how people adopt new revolutionary things, it takes at least a generation and sometimes more than a generation. But we are uh, in that process today. So let me start. Let me ask a couple of questions. First, uh, do we really need a lot more spectrum? Do we really need a lot of bandwidth? How have we met this need in the past? How are we going to meet it in the future? There's no question in my mind that ultimately we are going to avail ourselves of the freedom that allows us that, that, uh, that we get from having ubiquitous, uh, very low cost coverage. That is going to happen, but it's going to take a lot of regulatory creativity. It's going to take a lot of technological creativity. But the economy, you economists, those of you who are economists here, know that there is a direct correlation between our prosperity and our ability to communicate. We've got to move faster, and we will. So what is radio frequency spectrum? I've heard people talk about the radio frequency spectrum uh, as property, but spectrum has no substance, no dimensions, no real physical properties. In fact, for all practical purposes, the spectrum doesn't exist until you actually use it, or in some cases, misuse it. The unique property of the spectrum that's the real source of all of the technological, the legal, the regulatory machinations been going on for a hundred years and longer, is that any time you use the spectrum, you have to have some kind of exclusivity for your use. So spectrum is more analogous to space rather than property. And that's to say that two people cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Similarly, two people can't use the same piece of the spectrum at the same time. You can't build a fence around a segment of radio spectrum like you do with real property. Your neighbors, and that uh, in spectrum terms, whether well, these neighbors are uh, frequency neighbors, uh, the, uh, code neighbors, uh, noise floor neighbors, they always intrude on your property. Only a question of degree. And that's very simply why, for the last 100 years and longer, we've needed some form uh, of regulation. How did we discover that? Well, we go back to Marconi, and I like to talk a lot about Marconi because even though he didn't invent radio, uh, actually Tesla did, but, but Marconi had a much better press agent. But, but Marconi did, in fact, uh, commercialize a radio. Uh, and when he started out, he used essentially all of the radio spectrum uh, and had exclusive use of all of the radio spectrum. And then he actually did a commercial test where he uh, communicated to describe uh, of a uh, yacht race, of all things, and discovered that he had competitors, and the competitors had no choice but to use exactly the same thing Marconi was doing, all the spectrum, and nobody could end up communicating. Perfect example of 